Good. All right. 10 Delta. seconds to release. Roger. 50,000 feet. That makes it 40. That looks good. Coming on the pickle button. We're looking good. Clear to pickle. On the pickle button. It's swinging right and left. So yeah. Take what I can right here. Right Two. One. Laser's off. Bomb's off. gone. Bomb's gone. Roger that. Right turn. Coming right. Coming right. <laughs> 28 seconds. Roger. Waiting for 20 seconds. 20 seconds time to go. Laser coming on. Laser coming on. Got the laser on. Holding the track and steady on the far corner. Roger. Call sign. Calling good. 10 seconds. I've got a tally though. I think that's wedged to the south. Four, three, two, one. Good impact. Coming right. Lasers off. Coming we right. We destroyed that thing bigger than Dallas. Okay, coming right. Heading to the base plus 19. Roger that sequence. Yeah. Once you got within 80 to 100 miles of Baghdad, you could see the exceptional amount of AAA. It was at least five to ten times worse than my most vivid imagination. We knew uh, eight airplanes were going in at the same time, and every one of us thought that probably less than half would come out. We each prepared in our own way mentally. We tightened down our straps, zipped up our zippers, tightened our chin straps, kind of gritted our teeth and, and pressed on. War in the air changed in the Persian Gulf. For the first time, planners could select a target and with confidence have a single jet destroy it in one pass. With accuracy and precision never before associated with the aerial strike, aviators surgically eliminated critical enemy assets one by one by one. Once a mission for the B-52, the strike job now falls to the strike fighter Designed to penetrate enemy airspace, find the target and destroy it. High speed, deep interdiction is the striker's stock in trade. Three aircraft fly this demanding mission. The F-111F Aardvark, the F-117 Stealth, and the F-15E Strike Eagle. A strike mission is to, to go behind the enemy's lines and very simply to deny him the war fighting capability before it can be brought to bear against our own forces. Uh, in the F-117, we did just that. We slipped well behind the enemy's lines, right into the middle of the enemy camp, and, and denied him his ability, whether it was uh, to communicate with his own troops or uh, to gather the information so that uh, decisions could be made and the missiles launched. As far as uh, interdiction goes, we're talking about long range across the border. Uh, and by that, typically up to uh, 200 miles, uh, or 200 to uh, 600 miles, in fact, on the opposite side of the border for interdiction type targets. The uh, other concept involved with that would be the type target that we're going after. Uh, and primarily for the F-15E, we think in terms of uh, airfields, bridges, uh, highways, things like that, that uh, are stationary type targets that we can get fairly good intel for prior to taking off. Our primary mission is bombs on target, on time. You have one chance to do that, so everything you do, all your planning goes into the fact that you're going to find a target the first time. You're going to get in there, you're going to get the bombs off the way you want to, they're going to hit the target, and as soon as you do that, your primary concern is to get out of there, out of Dodge as fast as you can, one pass haul ass and uh, go home. F-117, we all want to use that element of surprise to get to a target and get back out. The F-117 uh, is not going to do anything at low altitude, uh, and they're not going to do anything at any real great speed. They're going to use the advantage of stealthiness to 
get them into target areas and get them out without anybody being able to see them. We don't have a capability for stealth, per se, uh, so we have to create that capability by going in at low altitude and start trying to stay below radar coverages to get in and get out of a target area. Our number one defense is stealth, and, uh, and in fact, we, uh, we rely on it, and we go in there depending on the stealthiness of the aircraft to give us the ability to concentrate on weapon delivery so that, if you will, we do not disregard the defenses. We just depend on our aircraft to uh, protect us against most of them so that uh, when we're committed to the bomb run, we are doing just that, the bomb run. We have the capability of uh, self-protection, which uh, the F-111 and the F-117 don't have. So in that respect, we're kind of ideal. We also have the target pod and the flare, which kind of turns night into day. So we uh, it's, we have a capability to find some targets that other airplanes may not be able to find. The uh, the 117 is obviously specialized in the uh, using the flare to find a target, and the, and the 111 is specialized in TFR. So we're kind of a combination of that, and we're a lot more flexible because of that. All strikers are not created equal an advantage to planners when it comes to matching a target with the capabilities of an aircraft. For deep interdiction, a favorite during the Gulf War was the F-111F. With both internal and external munitions racks, excellent speed, and low-level, night-terrain-following radar, the Aardvark delivered the largest payloads of the strike fighters, well behind enemy lines, crossing hostile territory 200 feet above the ground. airplane and uh, I think most people that, that see it for the first time are amazed at its, at its enormous size. It weighs, uh, it weighs over 50,000 pounds just sitting on the ramp and, uh, and it can carry a lot of gas. We carry 34,000 pounds of fuel inside the airplane with, with nothing in tanks. So it's a, it's a big, big airplane and, and when you first as you crawl up into the cockpit, uh, ladder on each side, uh, clamshell type uh, canopies that, that are uh, counterweighted so they just they come right open for you. And then the cockpit is small for such a large airplane. You sort of have to shoehorn yourself into it sometimes. But it's a well laid out cockpit. There's uh, flight controls on both sides, one set for the pilot, one set for the WIZO. Uh, each guy's got a stick, each guy has a set of throttles and flight instruments. Uh, the right side is predominantly where the uh, bombing and navigation equipment sits, and there's all kinds of displays for navigational status, where we are, where we're going, weapons, uh, arming status, and of course the attack radar, and the controls for the pave tack infrared set are on that side as well. To move the wings, this is sort of interesting, there's a, a handle above the pilot's left arm uh, mounted on the sidewall of the canopy, the cockpit, and he pulls the handle back to move the wings back and pushes it forward to move the wings forward. It's really as simple as that. And he can set the wings anywhere from 16 degrees forward all the way to 72 and a half degrees back, which really turns the airplane into a, just a dart. The F-111 has an ejectable crew cap capsule. In the event that we have to get out of the aircraft, we don't have ejection seats. In fact, we don't even wear parachutes. The entire cockpit leaves the airplane via a large rocket motor. A 70-foot parachute comes out and we float down to safety in that thing. And the F-111 has really a kind of an unusual intake system. The, uh, the cones uh, slide in and out of the engines to sort of massage the airflow going in there. Since the airplane is capable of flying at low speeds and uh, very, very high speeds, uh, the engines need sort of a more standard airflow in order to operate. So these things sort of move in and out. You know, we'll start up the engines and uh, cook up the avionics and get the INS going and, 
And there's a fair bit of uh, mission data typing that goes on. We've got to type in uh, bombing information and coordinates of all of our turn points. And so there's just a fair amount of bookkeeping that goes on. Once we get out into the arming area, though, near the end of the runway, uh, then there's some other things that we do. And uh, while the arming crews are pulling the pins on our bombs and arming up the, uh, the weapons, uh, we pull the pins out of the ejection system to ensure that that's ready for us should we need it. And we also bo uh, bore sight our pave tax system at this time. We have little targets uh, that are precisely surveyed and placed near the arming area. And we actually uh, bring the pod out of the aircraft, rotate it down, and uh, we scope out on these little targets and make sure that we have an accurate installation of the pave tag pod and we can correct for some of those errors at this time. When the Wizzo's done uh, queuing up the pod, he'll rotate that back up into the weapons bay, and when everybody's ready to go, we'll taxi the formation onto the runway. We do a few checks as we taxi onto the runway. We ensure the aircraft's in the correct configuration. Then we're looking for a run-up signal from the lead aircraft. We see the run-up signal, a finger in the air, sort of in a circular motion, and we run up the engines, lighten the afterburners one at a time to ensure that they do light correctly and that there's no blowout. Once we have two full afterburners going, uh, we've got over 25,000 pounds of thrust now out of each engine, and it's, uh, the airplane wants to leap into the air. Holding the brakes can be kind of tough at this time. Lead aircraft rolls. We're looking for a 10-second hack. 10 seconds later, we're off the brakes now, and the jet's running. While the F-111F flies a low-level, high-speed profile, the F-117 relies on its stealth to evade enemy defenses. What would be foolish in other jets is practical in the F-117. It will fly straight and level over the target, carefully guiding its munitions, flying with the knowledge that it is invisible to ground controllers and radar-guided missiles. Indeed, Planners will task the stealth to the most heavily defended targets, the very success of the mission reliant on its low observability. The F-117 was, was a black program. Uh, it was developed in secrecy, it was built in secrecy, and it was flown here in secrecy. Uh, stealth technology, is a, a fairly fragile uh, item. It could be exploited fairly easily. So to this day, when we go to air shows, the aircraft is, is kept behind ropes and you're not allowed to go up and, and touch and feel the airframe itself. Since the shape of the aircraft is uh, our main defense, our stealthiness, uh, the shape being what deflects the radar, in all directions except straight back to the center. And then uh, again, the skin being uh, the part that absorbs what is not deflected. Uh, so we spent a great deal of time making sure that the uh, outside of the aircraft is in pristine condition, that uh, the skin is just right. I do start at the left-hand side of the aircraft at the bottom of the ladder and, and walk my way around. Taking a, taking a good hard look at the outside because, again, the, uh, the shell and the, and the makeup of the outside of our airplane is our stealthy defense. And uh, taking a good hard look at the airplane from the left front side, uh, walking around to the, the pitot tubes, uh, I'll call them pitot tubes, the booms up front. We have a quad redundant system and, I'm, and, and a very, very accurate and precise system, and I take a good look at all of those. And while I'm there, a cursory look, if you will, at the infrared displays or the infrared sensors on both the top front and the bottom of the aircraft to, uh, to make sure, at least from the outside, they, that they look normal and everything's fine on those. Uh, back up underneath, we take a look again with a flashlight up underneath for uh, some of the systems uh, inside there and uh, walk along the back of the aircraft. And at about that time, the crew chief pulls the, uh, the drag chute pin. And we take a look at that, and then I walk back far enough to take a good look up and down the uh, both of our uh, tail fins and uh, up along the spine of the aircraft, uh, looking through the tails to see that the, that the door is shut uh, for the drag chute and that everything looks kosher along the top. But we have a, a roof in this cockpit, if you will, because it's not entirely glass-filled. Uh, sitting with a roof and, and the uh, support for the uh, canopy up above us, and uh, it's a heavy canopy. 
and then the glass on our sides and in front of us. Uh, the, the systems wrap around us as a normal new modern fighter cockpit uh, with the computer starting on the left-hand side and then wrapping all the way around with, uh, with cathode ray tubes. The visibility that the stealth has from, from the cockpit is exactly what we need. We need to have enough visibility to take off, land, find the tanker, refuel, and, uh, and, and, and look in front of us to uh, basically to get to the target area. Uh, so the visibility that we have is actually uh, quite adequate. Uh, again, since we fly at night, we don't expect other people to see us, so we're not really looking for them either. Once the aircraft is started, it's a nice quiet uh, engine sound inside. There's uh, really a, a comfortable uh, cockpit environment as far as air conditioning and sound. Uh, very pleasant. There are quite a few different light intensity controls to make sure that everything we want to see we can see, and for that matter, everything we don't want to see, we don't. Since our mission is at night, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, continually turning all these these particular displays down because we just don't need a lot of uh, at night to see. The Black Jet is an agile aircraft. It is not a dogfighting machine and, and was not created to do that and, uh, and, and was not created for many of the roles that our other fighters have been. Uh, Again, to be stealthy, we've had to give up certain characteristics, and uh, it is an agile aircraft, but not, uh, but not a dogfighter. Again, we're a strike aircraft to go in there and, uh, and be invisible and be accurate. And uh, to do that, I would characterize it as a very stable aircraft and a very accurate aircraft, and, uh, and for that matter, a, a, an easy airplane to fly. We had just developed techniques so that we wouldn't have to talk to anybody and we could get up, uh, get to the tankers, get our gasoline, get to the border, and get to the target without ever having to talk to anyone and without ever emitting any kind of energy, be it radio, uh, radar, whatever. We just did everything silent and, uh, and, and, and never talked. It's a great feeling of pride, one of strength to be sitting at the end of the runway and to look on either side and see uh, eight or 12 odd F-117s lined up in the, in the darkness with the silhouettes there along the uh, along the end of the runway, the, the arming ramp, and uh, see everybody on time, no one having to say a word, no everyone knowing exactly when to taxi and exactly when to take off, and uh, everyone being very precise and very professional. It was, it was uh, I was very proud of all the guys over there. They did a they did a wonderful job. Normally take off as single ship. Uh, since we do fly only at night, and since our airplanes are painted black, they're very difficult for for us to see each other. So we'll take off singly and then uh, and fly out towards the tanker. During the war, we would take off uh, just about 20 or 30 seconds apart and then fly out together, if you will, rejoin in the air using our uh, sensors on board and then fly to the tankers as pairs. Triple A's, we consider our biggest threat because of our, our stealth technology allows us to defeat the SAMs or, or somewhat negate the SAMs. Where other units can't even go, we do go nightly. Uh, we can do that by avoiding the AAA where other units can't even get in there. The SAMs would drive them down into the AAA. Although we spend a considerable, considerable time in the AAA envelope uh, without the warning, without the, the uh, notice that we're coming, we can usually be on our way out before the shooting actually starts, and that gives us a distinct advantage. We can rapidly outclimb it or get away from it, uh, and we don't have to face it on the way in where most of the problems lie. The F-15E Strike Eagle, the two-seat variant of the F-15C fighter. The F-15E gives planners a deep strike aircraft that can defend itself in an air-to-air -air engagement. Capable of extraordinary payloads, night low-level flight, and high-speed maneuvering, the F-15E carries sophisticated imaging, targeting, and weapons guidance systems, making it a formidable foe in air-to-air -air and air-to-ground combat. Uh, the Strike Eagle F-15E is basically, we. Uh, McDonald's Douglas took the F-15 airframe, and what they've done is they've improved everything. They've uh, made it in two cockpits. They've given it a brand new radar with uh, an air-to-ground mapping capability, which is 
the best in the world right now. Uh, it's a lot stronger for air-to-air -air, uh, radar purposes as well. Uh, it's also got uh, uh, the lantern system, which includes a nav pod for uh, terrain falling radar and looking forward in the FLIR, as well as a target pod. that we've used it's uh, the front seater rows the boat back seater shoots the ducks and what that means is the front seater is in, is responsible for flying and navigating getting to where we need to go the back seater is working all the sensors whether that be the air to air radar the air to ground radar the targeting pod trying to uh, find the target or checking six make sure we don't get uh, unobserved uh, um, shots or aircraft rolling in us so uh, for, in that respect having two people is great because we can uh, cover all aspects of what you need to do night interdiction as well as day and, and uh, during the war we ended up doing a lot of uh, um, scud hunting which was actually a lot of combat air patrol and as well we also use the, have an air to air secondary role so the F-15C model is primary air to air whereas we're primarily air to ground with a secondary air to air role. If the airplane is set up for air to ground which in this airplane you have to select the air to ground master mode to drop bombs off the airplane. Uh, and if the WIZO is uh, working the air to ground radar to use the uh, APG-70 to make a picture of the target we're going to hit, then if I, uh, if, I, if I select the air to air master mode uh, by using some of the weapon switchology, it transfers the radar from that air to ground operation back into air to air operation and it energizes all the circuits in the airplane so that I can shoot air to air missiles or fire the gun. The lantern gives me the terrain following radar, a infrared picture system that allows me to see at night. Uh, and by sea at night, you know, the HUD in the front of our airplane is a, a 14 by 28 degree HUD, and the nav FLIR portion of the lantern system puts a daytime presentation based off of infrared signature into that HUD for me. So I, at, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm actually looking out and seeing almost the same picture that I would see if the sun was up. Target pod half of the lantern system uh, gives me a laser designator and a magnified uh, target designation system. What I use to update the INS for the lantern would be the uh, targeting pod half of the lantern system. And what I can do with it is pull uh, menstruated coordinates off of a bridge or something I'm going to fly by en route to a target. Uh, and as I fly by that target, I can put the targeting pod cursors onto that bridge uh, and then just through a matter of a couple of switches, uh, tell the airplane that that is a point at exactly this set of coordinates that I loaded into the INS before I took off. Uh, and now it recognizes that, matches it to that set of coordinates in the INS, and updates the aircraft's position uh, into the INS and the mission navigator. When we do uh, carry precision munitions, uh, primarily the GBU-10, GBU-12. Uh, we're working on capabilities toward GBU-24. Uh, we, are, we are carrying some GBU-15s here at Nellis. Uh, we have quite, quite a capability for precision munitions. Below during Desert Storm for us, we always 
security tanks, which was something that we hadn't uh, really planned on before we went to Desert Storm. So either our jets had a centerline tank or two wing tanks, and on some nights we carried all three. As I popped and started climbing up to deliver my bombs uh, above the airfield, they still had the uh, runway lights on, the approach lights were on. Uh, they had no clue that we were going to be there. Now, once my bombs hit, it all changed. It was like someone had turned a switch on, and uh, uh, there was just thousands of bullets, uh, missiles coming up, uh, and it was the biggest light show I'd ever seen. And uh, being over top of it is not probably one of the most fun places to be. combat run. For strikers, it is one of the longest missions over hostile territory in military aviation. It is a mission that challenges the best of pilots. Physical endurance, precision bombing, evading hostile threats, aerial tanking, and returning safely home. contact position and the boom operator clears us in towards contact, uh, the pilot flies the airplane underneath the tanker and uh, most guys will try and ensure that their vector is parallel to the tanker. In other words, they're not flying up the boom because it's very difficult to judge overtake and distance, but they'll fly rather underneath the boom uh, with their fuselage parallel to the tankers so that they're not up into the tanker. Uh, once they got the height nailed, uh, they're at the correct distance to, or displacement below the tanker straight forward, and they continue to drive straight forward uh, until they get into position. We would typically take fuel from a tanker and then uh, cross the border uh, at medium altitude. Depending on the threat, we may let down to as low as 200 feet and skim across the surface of the Earth at uh, 200 feet and very high speed uh, into the target area. This makes it hard for the radars to see us. We deliver the weapons, sometimes one at a time, so we may be in the target area for quite some time delivering these smart bombs, uh, one bomb per target, and then we skim out uh, the same way we came in, usually taking fuel after we cross the border to make it back to our home base. A typical interdiction mission for the 111 might be uh, five to six hours long. The laser-guided bombs that we drop are just general-purpose bombs, no different than a 2,000 or 500-pound dumb bomb, uh, and they put a, a guidance kit on them, and the guidance kit consists of these large fins on the back of the weapon which pop out in flight give it almost wings in the back, and a steerable nose unit that has a laser seeker head, which reads the laser energy, and a smaller set of control fins. 
and these control fins actually move to keep the bomb, based on inputs from the computer unit, to keep the bomb on the correct flight path as it approaches the target. Now, obviously, the bomb has no motor, so the only energy it has to get to the target is the energy that the aircraft gives it. And that can be in the form of gravity as we drop it from a relatively high altitude, or from a low altitude delivery, we can actually throw the bomb or toss the bomb towards the target, giving it enough energy to correct its flight path as it, as it makes it. The meat of our practice missions is target recognition using our infrared sensor displays. Because, uh, again, a visual picture, a visual presentation is very, very different from an infrared presentation. And since we fly at night, everything we do will be infrared. And uh, let's say, for example, a building that's painted white during the daytime, if it's uh, depending on how much heat it gives off at night, uh, can be a completely different color depending on what we're using on our sensor, whether, let's say, black is hot or white is hot, depending upon, uh, again, the, the type of display we choose. So. What we do during our practice is, is understand the difference between a visual and infrared picture. Come on. That's the triangle. My target area. Laser off. Laser off. off. My target area is under the smoke. I'm picking this building here. 29 seconds. Focus faded. There's all sorts of debris down there. 20 seconds. 22 seconds. 20. Looking for 15. There's my building. 15, laser on. Laser's on. Finish the building. Okay, 10 seconds. Missile launch. 8. 1. Base spike, base plus 20. Jeff, Jeff. Impact. Impact. Like you wouldn't believe. Shaq, shit hot. Good to go. Lasers on. Spike, base plus 17. Okay, we got AAA blowing up below us. Okay. Okay, you're outside now. I'm outside. outside. Okay, I see the laser on. Continue, we got a cartel. Find your dimpy, we're about to get rid of the bomb. I've got Five it, six seconds. seconds. Laser is on. Bombs, Bombs are gone. gone. The tough part is approaching the target and trying to pick out your building or your specific impact point from this mass of uh, blips on the radar. Uh, the Wizzo's working very, very hard to do this, and once he's done that, he'll uh, use the PaveTac system to further refine it. Uh, once he can acquire it with the PaveTac infrared, it's really like looking at a TV. I mean, it essentially turns nighttime into daytime for us, and he'll place the laser on the, on the target and turn it on. And so now a laser beam reflected back to the aircraft is updating the navigational systems of the airplane and the pilot gets very very precise steering cues which he follows and takes him exactly to the point of release for the weapon when he fires a laser at a target or at any point he wants to update uh, the laser energy is then reflected back to the PaveTac pod where it's interpreted and converted into range information and this range and angle information then provide very accurate updates to the navigation and the bombing systems of the aircraft. So we can use PaveTac to very accurately find our targets and update our navigational systems. And we can also use the PaveTac laser to designate or steer laser-guided bombs. Uh, let's get away from the triple edge. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Start your turn now. Looking for threats to the right, and our heading is going to be about 250-ish. Uh, Sometimes, depending on the bomb run, we'll actually increase the lights on board just to inside the cockpit so we can take a real good look at the photos that we're carrying to make sure that what we're seeing on our sensor display is, in fact, uh, what we're looking at on our pictures. Center it up if you can. Center in the steering. It's coming right. 15 seconds. Coming back left now. Sloppy. Yeah, I know. Sloppy. Coming on the pickle button. Clear to pickle. Clear to pickle. Triple A is still below. Three, two, one. Bomb's gone. Bomb's gone. Roger Bomb's that. gone. Jap it, jap it, jap it. Oh, oh Somebody blew up my dippy. All right, move it. I'm going to try. Fire the laser, see if it gets there. Roger, you got 24 seconds. Oh, uh, somebody hit that one, too. Got to keep moving it. Picture clean. Yeah. One, coming up on the heading. I don't think it's going to get there. All no, 10 seconds. Keep firing it. Too late now. Yep. Five, four, three, two, one. 
impact. Okay. The long in the same area. Plus 20. Plus 20. All right. We call it a wheel, and uh, basically all you're doing is you're setting up between 15 and 20,000 feet above, um, you know, maybe a five mile radius around it. And again, we work in two ships in this case, and the first guy would roll in, drop his laser guided bomb, pull off and, uh, and guide it into the target, and then he would come off and the second guy would come in. And uh, we had to do buddy lazing because uh, a limited number of targeting pods, one per two ship. So uh, after the first guy with the targeting pod dropped his, he'd get into the wheel, the other guy would drop his bomb somewhere in the ballpark, and then while his bomb, after his bomb came off, the guy was in the wheel arcing the target would uh, guide the bomb in. That's what's called buddy lazing. So, and that we were able to get uh, 16 um, GBU-12s off instead of just having eight per jet. So it worked out well. Most of the pilot's attention was inside the cockpit, working on his sensors and delivering his bomb and his run in. Uh, when you did have the opportunity to look out, it was surprising how little AAA fire there was on your run into the target. As soon as the bomb hit the ground, however, every gun they had would start firing at you, uh, normally firing at either the sound or their guess as to where you were. Mostly seemed to be barrage type fire and was predominantly behind the aircraft. The Iraqis didn't know we were there until the first bombs went off, and so it was extremely important that when there were a lot of people going across the target, that uh, we had to be on time so that uh, we weren't setting the anti-aircraft fire off for our buddies coming in on perhaps a simultaneous attack in the same area. So yeah, there were quite a few attacks where um, the bombs would set the, uh, the light switch off, so to speak, and, uh, and the anti-aircraft fire would, would fill up the sky very quickly thereafter and we'd just have to fly through it on the way out. On our target run, we're committed uh, into a, a rather mundane G environment. We're committing ourselves to uh, the accurate delivery, so uh, therefore we'll kind of ride the bomb run out in a, in a fairly smooth manner to, again, increase the accuracy of the weapon. So it's, it's not the standard jink in, jink out that I was used to flying the S-16. The stealth capabilities of the aircraft allow us to do just that because we're not worried as much about the weapon guidance on us. We're, uh, we're flying a smoother profile and helping to, uh, to drop a more accurate weapon. We must maintain uh, guidance of the weapon during that time, so a great deal of what we practice is making sure that during entry into the area and exit from the area, while the weapon is being guided, we're being very accurate with the guidance on board. We wrap the rest of our ingress and egress profile around the guidance of the weapon. Over the past couple of weeks, the threats have been dying, or not dying, but uh, have, have reduced considerably until tonight. Uh, for some reason tonight, there must have been a half price sale on 37 millimeter ammunition or 57 millimeter because tonight the threats were back up. Baghdad's been pretty quiet for about two weeks. Uh, tonight, it lit up all over again. It wasn't nearly as bad as the first night, mainly due to the, the sector fire tonight. The first night, the entire city and everything near Baghdad was constant fire. You could almost walk on the bullets. Tonight it was that way, but in sectors. You could tell where a bomb would go off, the entire sector would just be engulfed in tracers. Uh, fortunately, most of them went off as we were leaving. We drop our bomb and set it off. Uh, but tonight, in small areas, was almost as bad as the first night. Well, I was uh, assigned to go against a uh, large hangar on an airfield. And uh, we, in fact, found the target. Uh, launched a precision guided munitions from a uh, rather long standoff range and it went right through the uh, side door of the hangar and destroyed the hangar. We saw some air to air and we saw some ground to air and we saw a lot of AAA and uh, uh, we worked for our money last night. The Strike Fighter, a powerful aircraft with sophisticated navigation, imaging, and weapons guidance systems. One bomb, one pass, one target. An imposing deterrent that has changed the future 
of war in the air. There are places in that country where, in the middle of a city, uh, a handful of bridges are missing. And that's the only real damage you could see to the entire city. Uh, and that was exactly what we went in to take out. We are in a trail, 22 ship at night, three to 500 feet, train following in groups of uh, four is what we had, all in uh, <clears throat> basically uh, two to six mile trail. So it was a long train and each two to four ship had specific targets to hit that first night. So that was a case of where we went in as fast as we could to make our uh, time on target, obviously. And once we got there, got our bombs off, then we were uh, pushing the mock to get out of there. And again, that was all low altitude. And again, that was the first night, and we uh, heard a lot of threats out there. A couple uh, Iraqi jets hit the ground trying to convert us at night. So again, the nighttime, uh, never thought I'd say this, but during the war, nighttime's good. Okay, you're 15 seconds. Okay, I'm going to catch you down. Okay, you count me. 69,000. Seven seconds. Okay, just wait till my call. I'll get your call. 62. 59. Friendly traffic, 2 west, base plus 17, also traffic, 10 miles, checking Ready, ready, they're gone. I heard on one of the news shows they were talking about killing these hardened aircraft shelters, uh, which was one of our, one of our targets, and the uh, gentleman talking on the show, a, a so-called expert, said that the way you kill one of these things is you, you take a lot of airplanes and you put every bomb the airplane can carry on this on this shelter. And uh, we found that not to be true. We found that you go out there with uh, an F-111 and you put one bomb on that shelter and you're going to kill it. And the first night of the war, we took, uh, we took four bombs against four shelters and uh, one bomb malfunctioned and the other three were direct hits and we killed three shelters with one airplane. And that was one airplane, part of a package. And we we found that we were able to, uh, with a with a package of F-111s, go to an airfield and and virtually destroy every shelter on the airfield in a matter of nights. Good flying weather for the uh, black jet is uh, absolutely as dark as it possibly can be. Uh, just a cool, nice night with uh, with no moon. The first few nights, of course, we, we didn't know that the airplane would work and, and, and had expected to take some losses. And uh, it was only after the first two, three, four nights of the war when everyone was coming back and no one was, having, uh, no one was hit that we began to feel like this technology works. So we, uh, the, the standard comment was that, you know, the damn thing works. Thank you. 